One of the things that we've been learning throughout our Purpose Driven Study has really been the importance of sharing your story. And I'm going to ask at this time for Gilbert, Johnny, and Astrid if they would make their way here to the my right, your left of the stage. And one of the things that we find is as you mature in your Christian life, part of your spiritual maturity involves sharing with others what God is already doing. And it's no coincidence that the number one fear in America is to speak in public before, no, I'm not going to tell them how many people are here, but you get the idea, right? But it's so important for other people to hear what God is doing in your life. So they're only going to talk for about two minutes each, but I've asked them and Russell's asked them to come and just share something that has impacted their life through this time that we've been studying what on earth am I here for. So Gilbert, why don't you come on up and then we'll have Johnny and then Astrid. This is Gil. Good evening. Good evening, my name is Gilbert, I'm the father of David Quinones, Happy David, all right? <laughs> He's now in San Diego. Uh, the purpose uh, of the life group has made us uh, very important in our lives. My wife, my child, that we be part of it, and I'm very grateful to thank God for it, and the leaders that we have, Caesar and Robert, have been back in my life a lot. Uh, it has helped me to open up more towards people. Uh, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I was able to reach out to a, uh, a kid that uh, didn't know Jesus. And I trained him for many years in baseball. And I just gave him a little verse. He had adversities and he was drafted. He was not able to be drafted by, through high school. And I told him, hey, you got to stay positive. You got to pray to God and, and give it you know, all to him. And came back and went out to Miami Day Community College. And he didn't do the purpose that he wanted to do, but he was given that chance to go to Miami Day. Well, apparently he was cut off the team. He came back and started talking to me and said, Coach, my, my life is ruined. I mean, I have nothing else to do. Oh, no, no, you cannot give up. And I preached this to my son and my family. Believe in God, have faith in God, and trust in him. And within two or three days, he was given an opportunity to go on a personal trial by the Chicago White Sox. The next day, they gave him a call to go to Arizona. He, he's a catcher. He did a 1.8 from home to second base. Threw five times straight and said, hey, we want you back in February. So he's... His opportunity has been given through God. Came back. One of his friends named Max. Talked to him also. I gave him a verse. That verse uh, apparently touched his life. And two weeks ago, he was baptized. And gave his life to, to Christ. <laughs> so my, my purpose of uh, going to life group is to put be open up to people and people you don't know and even the ones you know. The little seed that you put in your life to somebody else, just one person, you could change their lives. And then I thank God for that. Amen. This is Johnny. Hi, guys. How are you? Uh, I have to admit I'm really nervous. Um, just the fact that I'm up here is an uh, is, uh, answered prayer in itself. Um, I just, I guess I'm going to share, just, you know, just be honest and what my heart's telling me and um, what, what I got from these, these past six weeks of the Purpose Driven Life, uh, what I felt the most is, is God's unconditional love. Um, and he showed me that through, through the church, uh, through our pastors, <clears throat> and, you know, through a lot of things that happened in my life. Um, and now that I understand more the purposes of our lives, uh, you know, I have a different understanding of, of what it means to, to belong to his family, what it means to, that, you know, that we're created for his pleasure, um, but what it means to, to be loved. And, uh, you know, my prayer has just been to, to, for him to continue to, to help me grow and, and use me in my weaknesses and in my strengths uh, to fulfill his purpose, to, to continue to, to be like Christ by, by serving, um, you know, I love this church. 
I, I really do. I love everyone here, even though I don't know everybody. I, I, I just look at it differently now. I know this is my family, and, and it's just an honor and a pleasure to be able to serve um, through many different ways. And uh, I guess one more thing I'll share is the funny thing is this weekend, this week, Monday was my last day of the Purpose Driven book, and Tuesday when I got up, I was just like, okay, so what do I do now? I got no more purpose. I'm like, gosh. So I, I started praying. I'm like, you know, Lord, you know, help me to continue to grow because, you know, what do I do next? So I started reading the Bible again, and I, I'm reading the Old Testament now. And, you know, I was reading the part where <clears throat> the Israelites are in the wilderness, and, and God is guiding them with the cloud over the tabernacle. And, and even though they knew, <clears throat> even though Moses knew that they were being guided by God, you know, he prayed. He prayed when the cloud stopped. He prayed when the cloud moved, when the, when the fire stopped and moved. And it was just like God telling me, like, you know, keep praying. And, and, and I realized that, you know, we can have money, and it's great to, that's a great resource to give to, to the church and to our family and service. And I noticed, and I, me personally, the Lord told me, you know, don't forget that one of the biggest resources that we have as Christians is prayer. And I've been taking that for granted. I speak personally, and I think, Many Christians take that for granted because it's just so readily available to us. So that's like the last thing that stayed in my heart was to just continue to pray and to develop my, my prayer life. And I just want to thank Marcel and, and, and Russell for their support in these past six weeks. And, uh, and for this church, I, I really love this church and I'm so blessed and grateful to God. That's all I have. Thank you. This is Astrid. I will. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm going to piggyback on Johnny a little bit. I'm nervous, and I do this for a living. Like, I get in front of people, but it's a different when you tell your personal story, right? So, to start off, um, I'm going to talk about a missions trip and how that impacted my life. First of all, my girls started to go on missions trip when they were very young, like 14 and 15, and they traveled all over the world. And every single year that they would go, I'm like, oh, here I go again. I got to do lunches, I got to do garage sales, I got to do all this to help them raise some money, not really understanding what they were really getting from doing these missions trips until I went one on one. About a year and a half ago, Janet approached and said, hey, there's going to be a trip to Peru. I was so excited for that trip because it was the first time trip that my girls had gone on. I did everything. We did lunches with Ophelia. Every Sunday we would talk about how excited we were about the trip. And a month before the trip, unfortunately, I had a surgery that I had to go through where I couldn't go through my trip. And I remember the doctor saying, okay, you can't go. And then I would go to Janet. I really want to go on my trip to Peru. It didn't happen. They went, they came back. I was still out of work for like two months. It was, you know, something got complicated and so forth. And then she told me, okay, well, now there's another trip. There's a trip to Chile. Do you want to go? I'm like, put me down. I'm going. I went to Chile. We got back a week ago, a week and a half ago. And this trip has completely changed the way I see missions in my life. I remember every single time Russell will say, the second line on the envelope, right? This is for missions. This is what we support, the different missionaries that we have you know, across the border. And for me, it was just a line. It didn't have that significance until I really went out there and saw what they did. We went to Chile. We went to this amazing missionary. Her name is also Janet Lingo. And just by the way she received us and the love that she gave us and the support and to see that she runs this camp all by herself where they do, it's kind of like a Lake Placid where youth groups come there. Um, there's also... Um, family groups, women groups, and all that, and she leads this on her own. She does have a gentleman that I call him the do it everything because he does everything. His name is Charlie. He was the, the groundskeeper, the sound person, the engineer. He did everything for us. But the peace that you have and that you feel in that location and what this camp does, bringing the word of the Lord to all these groups that come there. It was just an amazing experience. And I think for me, I thank God that have been given this opportunity to go and really realize deeply how important that second line, put it with a face, a cause, a name to it. And make us, I know myself personally, I definitely need to be more faithful on that second line moving forward. And because now I know what they see with what they get, which is not really that much of support. So 
that completely has changed my perception about missions. Um, I think there's another trip coming up, and I already told Janet to put my name down. I think it's in March or April. And I even asked her, is it okay if I go again? She said, sure, Astrid, you can go. So I'm definitely going, and I'm really excited. And just piggyback on, I love this church. It's a family. One more thing, I met, I got to know two amazing women, uh, Mari and Muriel, that I really didn't know. We sit together on church, but I get to know them, their lives a little bit. They got to know me, and I think that all just bonded us more together. Thank you. Where do I go? <clears throat> Several of you have asked me about Beverly. Uh, last uh, Sunday, Beverly and I drove to Atlanta. Uh, they had a special pastor's marriage retreat. I'd never been to one of those. After 40 years of marriage, I thought I should probably go to one. And uh, we had a wonderful three days. There were 36 other pastors from all over the and their wives, of course. And we just had a wonderful time getting to meet them and some wonderful teaching by someone that I knew as an author but had never actually heard him, and it was better in person than in writing. And we had a wonderful time, but this next week being Thanksgiving, we always go to Thanksgiving in Atlanta with my wife's uh, family, so she just stayed with her mom. Her mom has Alzheimer's, and uh, she's aged considerably in the last four months, so just pray for Beth. It's just kind of a, a, a tough thing, and we're just going to enjoy Thanksgiving, and I'm flying back up uh, tomorrow evening, but thought I would come. You couldn't miss this. This is worth the flight. You know, it has been 37 years since we started this church. It was in November of 1977, and uh, I actually wasn't here the first Sunday. I didn't get here till the third Sunday which makes it 37 years and one week ago that I've been in the church. As I talk to different pastors, and they say, how long have you been there? And I'm going, 37 years, they all go, oh, wow, I've never met anyone that's been there that long. And that always makes you feel young. <laughs> but, you know, in the, over the course of the years, we've had different seasons in the life of our church. And one of the wonderful seasons in the life of our church was when we had this thing called YouthNet. YouthNet was a group of 19 different churches from all over Florida, and we would have youth camp together. We would have a week of high school and a week of middle school, and between them, we had about 900, I think one time I remember 945 between those two times. Besides the two weeks of camp in the middle of summer, the leaders from all of these churches, we all gathered throughout the year about once a month, planning. And I'll be honest, the planning was more fun than the camp. The getting together and the bond that we had and the things that we learned and, and, and a style of leadership that we learned from each other was an amazing thing. One of the people who was instrumental in that is the gentleman that I've asked to come and speak to us tonight. His name is Tony Isaacs. His full-time job is breaking boards and doing things like that. He, he, he has karate places. You said a new one in Naples, and you can talk about that if you want to. Just don't break my pulpit. But, uh, but really, his vocation is pastoring and has been and involved in the lives of people for many, many years. Today he serves Christ Fellowship down south that now I believe has eight campuses in this town, one of the wonderful churches that God's given us here in town. Now I've asked Tony to come tonight and just kind of challenge us and encourage us at this time. Thanks, Russell. Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Okay. Just sure. uh, my wife could not be with us tonight. I'm sorry she was ill, but I know she would have enjoyed. I just stood over there for the longest time and watched you fellowship and love on each other 
And I want you to know it's the best thing in the world to watch. Uh, it's even better when you experience it though, isn't it? Uh, as a family member. Uh, my wife, Levon, I have four children. All my four kids are all unique, just like your kids are. But what's unique about them at the very beginning of our ministry, uh, or their birth, was their, their weight. All my kids were over 10 pounds. Yeah, yeah. It's a big deal. My first one was 10'9". Uh, my third one was 10'2". Uh, and my fourth one was 10 exactly. My second one was 12'8". Uh, yeah, he was half grown, had hair on his chest, <laughs> tattoo on the side, it said mom. When Russell uh, called me a while back about uh, being here tonight, and um, th two things came through my mind. One was him, Russell Johnson, the other one was the purpose-driven life. And immediately three words came to my mind, and that was Krispy Kreme Donut. I know, it's, it's a theological thing, I know, and you got to get a hold of it. But I have a box of it right here, and I thought, yeah, how many like Krispy Kreme donuts? Okay, yeah, you guys are all sick, all right. What I like to do, though, is uh, just kind of, by way of introduction tonight, is just tell you a little bit about the Krispy Kreme donut. You may not have known this, but there's some great information about the Krispy Kreme donut. It was uh, created by Vernon Rudolph. And uh, he was the inventor of the Krispy Kreme donut. He opened his first store on July 3rd, 1937 in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. They have a mission statement. I don't know if you know this, but they have a mission statement and it says this. It is to touch and enhance lives through the joy that is Krispy Kreme. That's, that's no applause for that or anything like that. <laughs> Well, they have a vision statement also. I just want to share that with you. It is to be a worldwide leader in sharing delicious taste and creating uh, joyful memories. Yeah. Well, the Krispy Kreme donut has uh, eight wonderful varieties, if you didn't know. Glaze, jelly fill, peanut cake stick, plain powdered, coconut, chocolate, and cinnamon. Now, cinnamon is not with an S, by the way. It's with a C, just so you'll know. In 1992, Krispy Kreme gave birth to the Hot Now sign. How many have seen that Hot Now sign? Yeah. If you haven't, if you haven't it's a sign that comes on that tells that these donuts have come off the conveyor belt and they're ready to eat. And I don't know about you, when I see the hot sign, something spiritual happens within me. <laughs> it's like the car sees it itself, and all of a sudden, I'm making a turn into the parking lot. And somehow, the door opens by itself. It, I'm telling you, it's a religious thing. And I'm getting out, and I've already got my hand in my back pocket, ready to give money for some delicious Krispy Kreme donuts. Now, just recently, in 2011, they've also put an app for your phone. So when the hot sign comes on, yeah, wherever you're at, you start drooling down your mouth. You're ready to go. You're ready to eat as much Krispy Kreme donuts as you possibly can. Now, to me, that's great information, isn't it? It's just great. But let me tell you something. Krispy Kreme donuts were not made for us just to know about them. Krispy Kreme donuts were made for us to experience. <laughs> yeah, you know what's going to happen now, right? <laughs> no, it's good. I'm, I'm good. I'm telling you, right now, I'm on a high. <laughs> now listen, you just went through the purpose-driven life. You have gathered a lot of information. You have a lot of things going through your head. A lot of things that you're thinking are really cool. But when the most important thing about the purpose-driven life is that you just don't get information. It's not just a Bible study but it's an experience with God. He wants you to share your faith. He wants you to tell people about Jesus right where you're at. You don't have to be a preacher to do that. 
You can be a student. You can be a, a, a home mom. You, you can be, you know, at UPS. You can be anywhere. <laughs> Marcel, yeah. That is your job, right? He wants you to serve our community. He wants us to go out and paint faces, put up Christmas trees, rake yards, tell people how much we love them through our service. People need to experience God through your experience with them. And without that experience, all you've done so far is just gathered information. And it doesn't help anybody at all. It's just information. But when it comes alive, it's the most important thing that could possibly happen. Now listen, if I was to say, if there's one thing that I could settle on on the purpose-driven life that far as the biggest purpose that could possibly consume us, it would have to be worship. Your very breath, your being, proclaims who God is. We need to experience God not only worship during this time when we sing our songs, but every part of our life. It should come out. It should radiate from our bodies. Now, you don't have to, I know you don't have Bibles, but it may come up on the screen. I want to read a psalm to you. It's Psalms 148. And uh, for the last two months, I've kind of set this to, to memorization for myself. But I'm going to read it to you. Explain just a little bit about it. Draw a couple applications and we'll go from there. It says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all you heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shiny stars. I don't know how they do that, but they do. They praise God. Praise him on the highest heights and you waters above the skies. And this is what it says to that grouping that, to praise him. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For he commanded and they were created just by his words. Boom, they, they appeared. And because he created them, the creation somehow gives back to the creator and praise him. And he established them forever and ever. He issued a decree and they will never pass away. Now Rick Warren said, everything that has been created by God is for God to fulfill his purpose. I agree with that wholeheartedly. But then it doesn't stop with the heavenlies. It goes down to the earth, too. It says, praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures, and you whales, these huge monsters that are in the water, and you ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds. I don't know if they're doing that in Buffalo this weekend, but they snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding. You mountains and hills, all these things are praising God. Wild animals and cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth. He goes now from the animals to humans. Kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and you rulers of the earth, young men and women, old men and children. And then it says this phrase once again, let them praise the name of the Lord. For his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and above the heavens. See, I think the reason the ultimate purpose of our life is to praise the Lord. That's amazing to me that right now, as we are speaking, God, because he created animals, he created the wind, he created trees, he created the moon, the lights that go off into our universe, all praise his name. It must be a wonderful orchestra that we don't hear, but... God doesn't need us to have our little songs up here to fulfill his needs. God is being praised. And he invites us to experience him every day and to proclaim his word and to do his bidding the way he wants for his purposes, not ours. And that brings praise to him. Praise the name of the Lord. And there's many names of God. But I'm reminded that Moses... When he was challenged to go before Pharaoh, he said, now, God, who am I supposed to tell this guy who you are? Remember his response? I am that I am. 
I don't know about you, that's got to be the baddest name ever. Who are you? I am. That I am. Now, that word is a Hebrew name where we get Yahweh from. Yahweh is a really special name. It means present tense. It means that we get the theological concept of omnipresence. He's always present. No, no matter where we go or who we are or what location there is in across the world, he is omnipresent. He's Yahweh. His word alone gives us the sense that he is present. Now, what's really interesting about that word in the Hebrew, it, it's spelled out Y-H-V-H. -H. It's all consonants. It's, there's no vowels there. And uh, if you were to pronounce it out, it would be like yod he vah he Now, here's the truth of the matter of this word, of this name, that's Yahweh before us. The ancient rabbis would not even pronounce those letters for two reasons. Number one, they thought it was too holy. I am that I am was too holy for them to let it come from their lips. Yahweh. And secondly, those letters to them were unpronounceable because it would say essentially that it, it's really the sound of breathing. I don't know if you get this or not. When we breathe, apparently it says the name of Yahweh. Take a deep breath. Isn't it interesting when God created man, he put in the breath of life into that person? Isn't it amazing when a baby comes into this world, the first thing they have to do is breathe? And by the very nature of itself, of God, of who he is and what he has created, he allows us with our first breath to say his name. What an experience. What an amazing attribute that we have to understand that he's omnipresent and he is always with us. Isn't it amazing that when you enunciate yo, they, Hey, va, hey, it sounds like breathing. And how when we proclaim just through our being in the sound of breathing, we say his name. And when we give our last breath and die, we're done with this body, not with eternal life. But that's what God has set up for us. The name of Yahweh, the creature, our purpose I hope you get this, is to worship him, to love him, to adore him, to make it special. Now, Russell said that, you know, I'm with Christ Fellowship, and I am so blessed to be with a church that's really on fire for the Lord. You guys remind me a lot of our church. Some of the same dynamics are here. Now, we may be a little bit bigger. We have, we have eight campuses. We have 10,000 folks in our, our campus. I had been there. I've been there for 17 years. But three years ago, as the small group pastor, I made a promise I can remember when I first started in ministry. And I told the Lord, if I ever got to the place as a pastor where when I came into the worship service and I could not worship in spirit and truth, my mind was somewhere else all the time, or I, I was cheapening my, my experience with God, that I would step down. So three years ago, I stepped down from the most exciting church in the country, one that's still growing today. But it was so important for me by the integrity that God has given us as pastors to step down because my worship was not right. It's not like I was in sin. I just was not focused. It seems like I got there. I was so busy doing the work of the ministry that it was not real to me. And I wanted to experience God just like everybody else that comes to work, but I want it to be from the pureness of my heart. I want it, when we were singing, I was thinking of those words. When the pastors was, were speaking, I wanted to be challenged in how I was gonna apply that to my life. And God has took me away from that position until recently where they asked me to come back. And you know, it's like a, a fresh breath of air. It's like God, I could say his name again. 
It's like I could experience his hand again. And the joy of ministry was back in what I was doing. Why? Because I think the ultimate purpose for all of us is to praise the name of the Lord and to give him praise. Now, I want to read this psalm one more time, and then we're going to show a video. A little bit about word picturing 148. So listen once again. It says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him from the heavens above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun, moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, highest of heavens and you waters in the skies. Let the name of the Lord. Let's praise that name. For he commanded and they were created and he established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth. You great sea creatures and ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that will do his bidding. You mountains and hills, you, you fruit trees and cedars, wild animals and cattle, small animals or creatures and flying birds. Kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women, Old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. Just watch this piece. A couple more stars. This one is called the Vela Pulsar, and it's magnificent. It's a thousand light years away. It's a highly magnetized neutron star. Right. It simply means this star exploded into a supernova, and in the case of the Vela Pulsar, it collapsed back on itself in a magnetic entity, and as the pulsar, it began oscillating on its axis. This one oscillates 11 times a second on its axis. And that doesn't seem to move anybody tonight, so I just encourage you to when you get back to the hotel to oscillate 11 times a second on your axis, and you will appreciate the Vela Pulsar in a different way. And as it is oscillating, you can see what's happening. It's shooting a radio frequency out of itself. And so not only do we have this amazing photograph, but we're determined to hear somebody speaking to us. And so through SETI and other highly advanced um, electromagnetic telescope programs, we're listening to the universe day and night. And I don't know if you know this or not, but when I say we, I mean we as in your tax dollars are paying large sums of money to build radio telescopes that circle the earth to continually listen to see if anybody out there is speaking to us. Today, we have not heard any intelligent life speaking back to us, but we have gotten something for our money because when they aimed the radio telescopes at the Vela Pulsar, this is what they heard. And this is what this guy does 24-7, day and night, 365 days a year. This is what, from a thousand light years away, the Vela Pulsar sounds like right now. This is it. Listen to this. incredible you're like well what does it mean I don't know is that some kind of Morse code for something or what, what, what does all that mean I don't know what it means but and I don't want to you know go too crazy here but maybe the Vela Pulsar got wind somehow innately of Psalm 148 verse 3 and says, it says praise him sun and moon and all you shining stars we're a shining star we should praise him well how are we going to praise him I know let's oscillate 11 times a second on our axis and see if we can send a radio signal into the universe that would join in the symphony of God's praise from all creation. It's singing. The stars are singing to him. I recently stumbled on 47 Tuck. It's a, a beautiful uh, cluster of stars. We'll show you the picture of it here. It's about um, 16,700 light years away from where we are. And you can see just this brilliant, it looks like a sort of he shoved a lot of diamonds together into a pile. It's an um, unbelievable number of stars there. Look at these. They blow up that central place right there. There are 12 of these super giant blue stars in there. But the things that are of interest to us tonight are these millisecond pulsars, 23 
millisecond pulsars are there and we've recorded 16 of them. And right now tonight, while we're sitting in this room, the 16 recorded millisecond pulsars and 47 tuck are making this sound right now. Who knew? No, God has his own string section. <laughs> He's isn't that beautiful. And we just looked at one 11 times a second pulsar and 16 millisecond pulsars, and you start seeing Psalm 48 come to life. But look down at verse 7. It says, Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling His word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all people. So now He's bringing us in. We've got the heavens. We have the hosts. We have the stars, the sun, the moon. And now He says to the earth and He names everything on the earth in some form or fashion. And then He brings in us kings of the earth, verse 11, and all people, princes, and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. I love that he starts with you great sea creatures. We were in Hawaii a few months ago and it was whale season there and, and I was captivated by these giant beasts and they, they seemed like they were putting on a show for us. They'd splash up and roll over and spout and blow and it was beautiful and as we were talking to some of the natives about the whales and asking all these questions, how do they get here every year and how do they know to come to the same place to have their, their young, their offspring and how do they know how to journey and he said, oh you know the whales, one of the main ways they get around it is through the whale songs that they sing. And I got Psalm 148 all inside of me, and I'm like, no kidding, I, 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 I'm sure they do. And so I got to figure out what do the whales sing, and so I start doing a little research, and I go online to find the whale songs, and I just want to bring it to you, because some of you live in Minnesota and don't even know where an ocean is, and so the, the whale songs could sound like this right here. Take a listen. That's, that's, what, that's what's happening in all creation. And I had this crazy idea, and I, I, um, I don't know if you know what a mashup is or not, but I had this crazy mashup idea. And I started trying to think, what would it be like to be God? Because we so elevate our, our songs. And that, this is no comment on, on what we've sung tonight. I'm a songwriter, and I believe in artists. And I, I believe in what we do in corporate worship through song and through music. And, and one of the expressions of our worship. But I don't think we have a clue, because we don't know the expanse of the worship that is continually surrounding the throne of God. And our songs are great, but God isn't banking on our songs, because He is surrounded 
surrounded by a symphony that's bigger than our wildest dreams tonight. Stars sing and whales sing and the birds fly. And I just tried to imagine what would it sound like if you could just for a second be God and hear what he hears. And I can't get us there tonight, but I, I came close. I had a friend who helped me with this little iPad program. And, and, and I'm not a DJ, but I, I just a little thing, just quickly. And I, I want you to see how this works. I, I brought this guy in. Um, he's um, not somebody that we had uh, going already, but um, I brought one guy in. He, he should, you should be hearing him by now. I don't know. Are we, are we on? Yeah, if we could get you a little more volume, that'd be great. Thank you very much. This even a little more volume would be fantastic. Thank you. I'm kind of maxed out here. There we go. This guy, we didn't look at his picture. He's PSR BO329-54. And he's only rotating one and a half times per second, which is not all that much, but we need him in our little experiment we're going to do here, okay? Um, and then we had the Vela Pulsar. You remember the Vela Pulsar, right? So that's that guy. That's a little too fast for what we're trying to do, so we're going to slow that down, okay? slowed down and put in sync with each other. It's not a real groovy crowd, I know, but I, I know where I am, but it's kind of groovy if you hear it. And some of you want to nod a little bit, but you don't know if that's allowed at a reform meeting, and so um, you just do as the Spirit leads. But isn't that cool? That's just two pulsars. And so we're going to put the, uh, the millisecond guys in there. The ones you just heard, here they come.
you know, you're like, whoa! Isn't that great? How many are breathing? Yeah, that's everybody here, right? You're praising the name of Yahweh. You are praising by your very being who we are. He spoke and we came into existence. The most ultimate thing you can do in the purpose of God is to worship him in spirit and truth on a daily basis, on a moment by moment basis. It's not just reserved for 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. It is a lifestyle. His creation is praising him. If we like it or not, much better than we are, most likely. He's asking us to join along with him. The greatest purpose in your life is to praise God, to give him honor and glory. I'll share this one last story and and I'm done. Uh, I shared this briefly with Russell. Uh, Before Christ Fellowship became what it is, the study that we were going into was the purpose-driven life. And we had all the books, we had all the material, all, all our leaders had read it, we had gone through it, and then through God's perfect design, we had a church split. And it was because of the purpose-driven life, believe it or not. Now, we came through that, we lost 150 people, it was a small split. In two weeks, we gained 300 people back that were new, and it hasn't stopped since. Now, I believe God used that book in our lives as leaders to prepare us for something great. And my challenge for you and your journey on understanding God's purpose for your life is to, to hold on just a little bit. Breathe out God each day of your life. Share your faith. Serve your community. Do the things that are right. And I, I, I will guarantee you, God will do something just incredibly great with this congregation. Live out your life for him. Lord, thank you for our time. Thank you for challenging us to be more like you every day. Christ, thank you for indwelling us so that we might have the power of God within us to face each issues that we have each day. Help us to breathe your name. We love you, we thank you, and we praise who you are. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.